uh, former uh, foreign minister of Germany, it's an honor to have you with us, sir. If you could uh, ask your question or make your comment, please. I don't know where the microphones are. Do we have microphones somewhere? No. Thank you. Please. Here we go. Mike is on the way. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, uh, very important discussion. Now, allow me uh, to make uh, two remarks uh, following the discussion. Uh, first, a more abstract remark. I fully share the view of uh, Stephen Hadley that economics matters uh, for the success of the democratization movement. It's not all about economics, but it's uh, a key factor. And in economics, I think, uh, there is another element uh, which should be really promoted and pushed forward, and this is governance. Uh, without governance, you can't fix the economy. Or if you can fix the economy because you are lucky, the environment uh, is in your favor, then usually this uh, leads into a development of a huge corruption. Yeah. So from my point of view, uh, what we have learned in uh, uh, recent decades is that governance uh, plays a very important role. Secondly, there is no democracy without Democrats. You can have uh, democratic elections or whatever, but if you don't have Democrats, this ends up in a power struggle in uh, uh, political corruption. So from that point of view, I think the United States and Europe, with all the resources um, they still have, um, would be well advised uh, to invest more uh, in the support and education of um, uh, developing uh, Democrats, uh, because this is an essential part of democratization, otherwise uh, I think this will fail. Secondly, we have problems, severe problems in countries uh, which were pretty successful in the democratization process, even inside the European Union. The issue of uh, um, uh, democratization is now raised again in Hungary. Uh, it's sensitive, I understand, member of the EU, member of, uh, uh, of NATO, but it's an issue. Um, secondly, I think uh, uh, democratization and the success of democratization is all also connected to a strategic um, uh, elements. For the Russians, it's quite clear. Democratization means um, a soft Western strategy of regime change and changing zone of influences. Um, I think that uh, we should really understand the importance of the success of democracy and preserving the independence of Ukraine. I'm a little bit concerned, or maybe delete a little bit. I'm concerned about uh, the silence in European capitals as in DC about what's going on in the Ukraine. And not only the question of democratization, but also uh, that Ukraine is under pressure to decide in which direction she will develop. And for me, the Ukraine, uh, it's a complicated country, to use a diplomatic uh, uh, word, but uh, uh, it's the cornerstone of the post-Cold War order uh, in Europe. So from that point of view, uh, my question is um, uh, whether our uh, elected leaders uh, on both sides of the Atlantic uh, uh, have forgotten the importance of the Ukraine because uh, I don't see real diplomatic activity or... Uh, um, um, whatever, um, and Ukraine, the Ukrainian government, which is, there are a lot of question marks, but uh, they are under pressure now, uh, and they are under pressure to decide in which direction the country will go. And if the country will, uh, um, I wouldn't say lose its independence, but if it will change back in the zone of influence uh, um, from where the country was uh, coming from, I think the strategic as the democratic uh, uh, future of the country and of the region will change, uh, will change dramatically. So it's it's a combination uh, uh, of that. And thirdly, Turkey. Um, I have very mixed feelings about Turkey because it's a generation Erdogan which is turning against Erdogan. Erdogan was very successful in democratizing uh, the country and modernizing the country. We shouldn't forget that, especially in the present situation. But on the other side, it seemed to be that he starts now to ruining his legacy. And Turkey is a key country, and especially based on the successes of the AK party, 
in the last decade. So from that point of view, I, and Europe contributes to the success as uh, to um, the failure because uh, blocking Turkey from uh, further progress from EU enlargement um, had also, I think, a negative result uh, for the internal development uh, of Turkey. I once, allow me uh, uh, to say that, I once had a discussion in Turkey around about two years ago when I thought, well, Turkey said farewell to the EU membership and you are doing it now alone and so then a Turkish um, uh, member of uh, the discussion uh, raised his voice and said uh, he has a very different view. He thinks that without Europe, the institutional modernization of Turkey means democratization, further democratization and stability of democratization uh, will be at stake. And uh, unfortunately, I think uh, 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 this Turkish colleague was right uh, in his assessment. So, from my point of view, it would be extremely productive if Washington DC and European capitals and Brussels could make the same messaging now. Uh, because Turkey is really for the future of democracy, not only in Turkey, but in the whole region, but also by strategic reasons, mm -hmm. I think a, a, a very important factor. So if America and Europe, which is a complicated relationship because Americans don't understand why the Europeans still, I mean, uh, not acting together and so many voices, different interests and so on, but it is as it is. So, but if America and uh, Europe uh, could uh, coordinate and uh, define their message uh, to Erdogan, um, I think this would be extremely helpful um, to create a better atmosphere for compromises because if you think about the reasons why these mess started in Turkey, it's unbelievable. It's about a park. Usually, I mean, this is... Uh, not prime minister's business, but mayor's business. And uh, usually Finnish, you sit together, you are not sending in the police, vegetables. the riot police, but you are bringing them to the table and trying to compromise. So I think uh, when we talk about uh, uh, growing democracy in the transatlantic sphere, mm. Turkey nowadays is, uh, uh, is a common challenge and uh, I think we should address the challenge together. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for that very, very important uh, intervention. Uh, so let me take, in, in a way, three questions back to the panel. And because we want to get in as many questions as possible, if you just pick which you'd like to do in this, and, and then we'll uh, and, and make it relatively brief. But the first is Turkey. And, and, uh, and Ken Roth of Human Rights Watch has made the argument this week as well that the European Union is uh, co-responsible in a way for where Turkey has gone. Uh, in a more nationalist direction rather than a more European direction. He, he called it the liberalism of Abdullah Gul rather than the nationalism of Erdogan. I'm not sure if I would totally agree with that. But uh, So first of all, Turkey, Ukraine, and Hungary. I will pick please. Ukraine, please. Yep. <laughs> first of all, uh, Minister Fischer, I would not agree that there is a silence about Ukraine and there is no diplomatic activity. There's a lot of uh, diplomatic activity that's ongoing now with Ukraine. Uh, I would not refer only to the Polish activities, uh, which are uh, enormous, and, and we are first translating Ukraine to Europe and translating Europe to Ukraine. So that is uh, obviously a, a, a huge challenge. What I want to say about Ukraine, not uh, to, to, to go into details, that definitely, uh, as you pointed about Turkey, it's uh, one of the key challenges for the future of democracy in, in, in the region. The same we can say about Ukraine. It's absolutely, uh, absolutely the key factor for the future of, of the whole region. Uh, but uh, saying this, I, I want also to, to, to send the, the message that we are trying to send to Europe quite often about how to deal with Ukraine. Now, the, the classical uh, uh, European approach is just sitting uh, over the table and dialogue. What we want, what you can uh, do, setting up uh, uh, an agreement uh, and the rules of the game. And in case of Ukraine, this methodology is not necessarily the, the, the best one. In case of Ukraine, uh, what we promote very much is more the coach approach. Let's do this together. Let's work out the issues together. Uh, uh, so in a sense, it's not a negotiation, it's a more coaching. 
And if we take this approach, taking into account that the Homo Sovieticus is still very present there, so whenever they sit on the different sides of the table with us, the, the, the Homo Sovieticus is growing in their minds. And then they are trying to analyze what is our, you know, uh, uh, we victory, what, what we lose, what we win. So it's a kind of uh, a game and then those calculations, uh, whether we are um, earning on, on future membership uh, or, or association agreement or we are, or we are uh, losing how it would work. When we coach them, suddenly we discover that they, they really are more and more alike us and they, they share the same of way of thinking. And that is something about Ukraine uh, we have to very much uh, understand when we try to uh, simply analyze uh, the situation of democracy, of human rights, of, of Mr. Timoshenko case, and many, many other issues. That the Ukraine should not be, uh, 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 should not be uh, uh, dealt in a simple way of, of, uh, of negotiating table. Yeah, but isn't part of the problem here, Yerzy, that uh, with, on the case of Ukraine, and one of our regulars here, a member of the International Advisory Board of the Atlantic Council, Alexander Kwasniewski, is, is taking care of this now. I mean, in this week is the reason it's not so. here. Um, but isn't uh, the question here partly, do what, does one embrace uh, an imperfect Ukraine in hopes that one can Im, it, it, you know, help the country evolve within European structures, or does one respond in a tough way to the things that are imperfect about Ukraine and then risk alienation and a worse outcome. I, how, do you measure, how do you weigh those, th those things? Well, uh, the, uh, tolerating yeah. something you shouldn't be tolerating, on the other hand, potentially alienating. You're absolutely right. I mean, the risks are, are, are huge and the challenges are huge, but the Ukraine is not a one piece. It is a divided society. You have a, a plenty of actors. You have also external actors that are playing a role there. So in a sense, uh, this is not a clear picture. And when the picture is not clear, uh, it is uh, uh, very difficult to take uh, a black and white uh, approach. And that is exactly what I was trying to say. The approach when we try to coach, when we try to ask them, tell me what are differences between you what you agree on, what you disagree. Uh, don't, don't negotiate this with me, but I want to listen to your own discussion. That's what co coach yeah. does. Yeah. So uh, uh, and if, you, if you are absolutely uh, on one side on the specific issue, my role finishes here. But as long as you are different and you can find a common line and then we can work it out together, that is the way to do. So you're absolutely right. They, they, there is a certain moral difficulty in doing so, because you would definitely find also in Ukraine people that you, would, you wouldn't want to deal with them, mm -hmm. because they really represent a different set of values. Yeah. But they do not represent whole Ukraine. That's the answer. Yeah. Steve, to Micah. Steve. I, w I have just a big point. I agree with a lot of what Joska Fisher said. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting we've got now three categories of problems. You set out the first two, and I'm not going to get it as well as you did it, but basically, helping people struggling for freedom before the dictator is, is toppled, then helping them in the immediate aftermath of the toppling. And then the third category is backsliding. Backsliding friends and others. Backsliding friends, Turkey, Ukraine, backsliding others, in some sense, Russia at this point in time. What do you do about those? Three different categories. And Fred, if you took seriously this idea I had of a working meeting, a sort of track one and a half yeah. for a day or two before your next conference. Yeah. We could have a European-US dialogue on what are the techniques and approaches to each of those three groups. And they, in some sense, could report to the conference next year on the results of their work. And you would have a, a down payment on an ongoing US-European dialogue on, on democracy and freedom promotion. And, and backsliding is becoming a bigger issue. Bigger issue. Yeah. Um, the, uh, on Turkey, do you want to pick up? I know you have a lot of thoughts on Turkey. I wonder what you Look, want to pick up. Look, you know, I, the, <clears throat> I, I think the important thing is that while making a point and of concern about what is happening, 
in Turkey. We make it clear that it is in, in the context of friends talking to friends. Um, you know, this is a delicate time for Turkey. And suddenly, you know, as we saw a Turkish gentleman in the panel yesterday, and if you saw it, he brought a stack of newspapers. And it all, they all had the story about violence in Turkey, front page, above the fold, every paper. He said, you know, we've been active in a whole lot of things for a number of years. We've never got publicity like this for any of the good things we do. And suddenly, you know, it's front page above the flow. Are you folks our friends or not? <laughs> and, you know, they have a point there. So I think one of the things we have to make clear is our commitment to the visions that the Turks have set for themselves is clear. Uh, we support the direction they've been heading, which is more democratization, prosperity, um, and playing a more responsible role in the region. And so after the embrace, say, but we understand this is a difficult time and we want to help Turkey through because we think it is so important that per Turkey be an example for this part of the world at this crucial time that we want to do all we can to help them resolve this internal crisis in a way consistent with democracy. So Turkey as an example for democracy remains here and active in the region. I think a lot of it is the tone with which we take it because in the background we have to recognize we have not um, given Turkey the support um, for EU and membership in the EU and a lot of other things that we should have done. They have been a little bit of uh, an ignored stepchild uh, from time to time, and we have to recognize that that we suffer from that. Yeah. So delicacy um, and always making clear that this is advice to a friend yeah. from a friend. Yeah. So that's, uh, I turned it to Mike, and Steve Hadley made a, a somewhat controversial statement in Istanbul not long ago, asking the question not of whether Turkey would join the EU, but whether the EU would join Turkey. But uh, <laughs> Since Turkey's economy seemed to be doing a lot better than the European economy. I, I see but questions, <laughs> but do you want to briefly jump in here? Is, I, I'd okay. be delighted to, to take on yeah. Hungary, if, if yeah, possible. Please. And uh, I left Budapest yesterday morning after having, uh, the day before, delivered a, a big speech on the importance of democracy and democratic institutions. And this is the grandson of Tom Lantos, by the way, uh, uh, one of the great Congress congressional leaders of America, and so a lot of history with... Hungary as well. Well, and uh, you know, one of the things that my grandfather was always very proud of is the great tradition of democratic values in Hungary. Uh, and that, of course, uh, manifested itself in 1956. In 1989, you had heroes like Mark Palmer, the U.S. ambassador. Who, uh, who we are honoring this evening. Who, who really yeah. set an example together with many Hungarians of what a democratization process can look like, uh, and a, an example that is still looked at uh, around the world. I was in Burma a few weeks ago, uh, where leaders were very curious uh, to hear more uh, about the Hungarian roundtable and how that process unfolded. Uh, but the reality is that we have very serious concerns about the situation in Hungary, and we have articulated those concerns both in public uh, and in private. Uh, and we have a, a situation in the country where, while we maintain very good relations and very strong cooperation on many issues, uh, we have uh, leaders at the highest levels of officialdom who have spoken admiringly uh, of an eastern wind blowing. And uh, I, I think it's important to recognize that to the extent that phenomenon exists, it is a wind that is often uh, carrying a smog of corruption, of cronyism, and of compromised legitimacy. And these values have no place within the Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, so again, we continue to have very close cooperation with our Hungarian partners uh, on a number of critical security issues, and, and we certainly hope uh, that that will continue. Uh, but on issues of religious freedom, on issues of judicial independence uh, and elections, uh, we're worried about some of the trends that have emerged, and uh, we hope that it'll be possible uh, to work together to address those trends. And how do you work together with the EU specifically on Hungary? Or, well, or again, uh, we, we certainly have those conversations. Right. <laughs> Ultimately, it's going to be critical for European institutions to step forward and address these concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, while we can and do uh, speak out and we can and do uh, share uh, our thoughts on these issues, uh, to some extent, the, the most effective interventions that can take place uh, will occur within the European family. Absolutely. Um, okay, so let's scoop up two or three questions. I see Prime Minister Aziz and right here, Walt Slocum, and I thought I saw another hand 
here, but but let's let's pick 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 these up, and we'll get two or three. And if you Fred, could I, uh, identify into whom you pose a question, I just have a brief comment. Yeah. Uh, on Turkey, I totally agree with Steve. I think uh, if you read the press, I still see a disconnect between reality and what the posture in the press is. Taksim Square is not Tahrir Square. And if you read the tone in the media, if you're not uh, very close to the situation, you'll think it's very similar. It is not similar. First of all, Turkey is a democracy. Turkey has played a major role in the region and beyond in stabilizing uh, issues and has a very mature approach on uh, handling uh, issues in the region. I don't want to go into each detail, but I think we team seem to uh, demonize uh, countries very quickly without going into the depths. So Steve, your comments were right on the button because Turkey will continue to play a role in that region. Uh, I won't comment on the EU entry and, or lack of entry. And do not underestimate the importance and influence of Turkey. Also, if you have 30,000, 40,000 people in a square <coughs> and there's police action and there probably is uh, coming from a country where 30,000, 40,000 is a small crowd, this is not really a major issue. No, I'm not saying that the police should act beyond their writ, but these things do happen. But the core issue is uh, democracy must function in Turkey, the rule of law must function in Turkey, and let the government handle their local issues to the best of their ability, staying within the constraints of human rights, democracy, and ability to uh, do what is right. Second point is only on, uh, Syria was mentioned, and I would just say, look at Libya, now we are looking at Syria. What I found is that the entry strategy into these countries of conflict, or potential conflict, by various stakeholders is looked at and debated and discussed. But the exit strategy or the post-entry strategy has not done as well as it has. So we have to be very careful who intervenes, how we intervene, and then if all these weapons end up with various people, where will they proliferate? Will they go down to the south of Africa as they did in the Libyan situation? This, a lot of these actions create very unexpected reactions. And we must remember in closure one thing, Newton's third law of motion. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. As amended for today, every action could have a very unpredictable and unplanned reaction. Thank you. Thank you for that wise intervention, uh, Prime Minister Aziz. Um, the universal wisdom remains universal. <laughs> uh, uh, Walt Slocum. Mr. Tillman mentioned this, the importance of institutional development as the foundation for democracy. But I think the discussion has underestimated the importance of that. There is a real tendency to, to equate elections, particularly the first election, with the introduction of democracy. Uh, <laughs> President Aristide, who didn't live up to his principles, said the important election in a transition to democracy is not the first one, it's the second one. Uh, but it, I would be interested in the panel's view on what is necessary to promote the, uh, these institutions, which are much deeper in the culture, much deeper in the society than simply holding elections. There are a fair number of countries. Iran will hold an election in which the count will presumably be more or less honest unless it comes out wrong. Uh, but because the system is so manipulated, it's not a, in any sense a genuine democracy. There are other examples of cultures which are relatively stable, rule of law, human, relatively human rights respecting, which don't have elections. Singapore being, in a, being a, a, they have a, they have nominal elections. The Soviet Union had elections. Uh, but it would be interesting to hear the panel's view on what outside forces can do to develop the, this sort of infrastructure that is necessary for stable and enduring democracy, and in particular <clears throat> for, re for elections to be more than simply demographic referenda. Thanks, Walt. Before I bring it back to the panel, is there another question that I was missing here? I saw, yes, please. 
Kinga Brudzińska, uh, Polish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, when everyone agrees that the coordination is needed, um, no, one want, no one wants to be the one that is coordinated. And my question is to Minister Pomianowski, how the EED plans to um, coordinate its activities with other institutions already uh, present on the ground, for example, in Tunisia? Thank you. Thank you. So I'll have that question to you and then the institutional question. And of course the institutional question is an interesting one because in Europe you had the European Union and, and people coming in the European Union had to be part of those institutions. So that sort of happened. But what happens in Middle East and North Africa and places where that's not extant? Please. I'll give you a, a, a philosophical response and then maybe you could talk a little bit about the institutions we have and the, the tools we have to help. You know, this relationship between Elections and democracy is an interesting one. Um, and I think the way you say it, it is, Singapore notwithstanding, it is hard to have a enduring democracy without elections. But of course, elections alone don't make a democracy. But I think one of the things we've found is that when elections have been a vehicle for moving from an authoritarian to a popular or more democratic system, they, they um, create some momentum in favor of institutionalizing democracy, which talks about creating the institutions of responsiveness and rule of law and the like. We have seen that. Um, but that is hard work. And the problem I've got is that I don't think the United States, at least, has spent enough time developing the civilian expertise resources and expeditionary resources that have some experience helping countries develop these institutions. We've tried to do it in post-conflict situations after Bosnia and Afghanistan and Iraq. We did it a different way each time, I think not particularly successfully. It's important to make an investment and develop these capabilities because we need them not just in post-conflict situations, but we need them in situations where countries are failing and they're failing in part because they don't have the kinds of institutions of security and responsiveness that consolidate support among their people. So the same set of skills you need for post-conflict stabilization, I think you also need in conflict prevention situations. So I think they're a very important set of skills, but we just, in my view, have not invested on them as a government. And then the question is, can civil society and other organizations substitute for an inadequacy on the government side. But this, I think, is one of the big lacks in terms of the toolkit we need for dealing with the kinds of problems we're facing in the, uh, in the, in the 21st century. I think, uh, if I may just comment on this, because it comes very close to what I was doing for three years in the OECD, when we pick up some Stephen Krasner ideas. Right. Of, uh, of contracting out government services in post-conflict environments. And that's exactly was one of the methodology that is still on the process of development and still we are not yet sure whether it will work or not. It would, it would work in some situation, like for example, we have a case of Mozambique where for 10 years uh, the customs services were outsourced, or outsourced to the external agent. And it, it, it proved work very, very well in a sense by this process of 10 years, there was, first of all, no corruption. <laughs> Secondly, the Mozambicans, they have learned how to do it from the external agent, and they, and they took up uh, a role by themselves after this 10-year process. So if we imagine uh, some post-conflict environments like in Libya today, that's a very good uh, possibility for this kind of methodology to be used. Uh, uh, because uh, th this is a country where basically all government institutions collapse. Our government systems collapse. And, and, and there is no way you can build them overnight and, and, and even in a, in a period of one or two years. So these are the moments where we can use some kind of innovative technologies. Uh, it's not directly refers to democracy, but that is enabling environment. Because in such a situation, um, you can make people believe that the states deliver, so you can start a building an environment for the social contract that is result of election. Uh, but here we come back to the, to the main, main, main uh, issue that, uh, of course, when democracy does not deliver economically or through the governance, of course, uh, the people are losing their faith. So from this perspective, 
It is as obvious for uh, uh, post-conflict, for young democracies, but also for old democracies. And that is uh, just the scale of the issue is different. Um, but, but here I would just comment to, to, the, to the concept of, of, of substitution and using outside systems in order to help uh, uh, governments to deliver when they are already on their way to democracy. Mike, I wonder if you can deal with the, this question of institution, but particularly we have a real situation in Libya uh, on, uh, on, on this administration's watch uh, where this question of uh, thinking about going in but not really thinking and getting planned well enough of what you do once you're dealing with it, and, and not just the U.S., you know, NATO, other countries. So, so if you could address the institutional issue but also address Libya a little bit as well. Well, first, I think uh, whenever we speak about uh, democracy, it's important to recognize that democracy is an operating system. And for too long, we have focused on elections as the critical element of that operating system. We're now starting to recognize, I think a bit belatedly, uh, that it is, uh, again, only one small aspect of the operating system. And unless the entire operating system is functioning properly, you're going to get regular system crashes. Uh, and uh, we need to, to start addressing that. Along with that, we are seeing some, some innovative efforts. Uh, Poland and the United States, for example, for the last two years, uh, have co-chaired a multilateral task force uh, to support institutional development in Moldova. Uh, and we've seen some very good efforts emerge from that, including uh, the co-funding of initiatives uh, within Moldova to strengthen local governance, and, and Poland has taken a, a key leading role on that. Uh, but we need to do a lot more, and I think we recognize the need to do a lot more. Uh, in the MENA region and countries like Libya, uh, we recently launched a new initiative called the MENA Partnership for Democracy and Development. And it's headquartered in Tunis, but will operate uh, across the neighborhood. Uh, and it is designed to put uh, the tools that local uh, and federal and uh, civil society leaders need uh, into an almost catalog form. So they'll be able to go through and identify uh, what are the capabilities uh, that they stand, uh, that they need to expand uh, within their institutions, uh, whether that's fiscal management, uh, whether it's communications, uh, whether it's technology. And then we're coming together with partners in civil society and the private sector uh, from a range of different countries uh, to make those resources available uh, on a heavily subsidized basis uh, so that they can get access to the instruments that they need in order to build up institutional capacity. Uh, again, that's only one of many solutions, and we're going to need a lot more work on this uh, within the context of Euro-Atlantic institutions and within the context of the community of democracies uh, to address this challenge. Uh, but we see the need, and, and that, I think, is a first step. Very interesting. Uh, Very there was a question uh, specifically addressed to EED, yeah. so I would Please. feel obliged to, Please. to answer. Uh, about the coordination, uh, uh, the basic uh, slogan is very right. Uh, everybody would like to coordinate, no one wants to be coordinated. But uh, my res response uh, regarding endowment is, is very simple. Uh, in this case, uh, we will try to, to break this paradigm and we would be happy to be coordinated. So the first approach of the endowment is we are asking all partners around us uh, what is that you would like us to do. So that's a very humble approach. What are the niches where we can fit and you would be willingly inviting us to fill those gaps? And we have identified several of such gaps. One of them in, in, in a European system of uh, providing support uh, um, for democracy uh, activism is that in general, uh, the whole European system of support is based on, on project financing. So uh, uh, there is a good reason why it is so, but during this evolution toward pure uh, project-based financing system, some elements of, of other forms of, of support disappear. Uh, uh, the, I am referring to core institutional funding. Uh, so nowadays we have a situation when many NGOs, they are asking for European assistance, they cannot ask just for support uh, to build their institutional capacity. And here endowment comes uh, with the support without violating overall general principle because we know if those uh, uh, um, uh, NGOs 
those groups, they do have capacity enough, strong, to run uh, good and big projects, they will apply for different sources of funding from whether commission or, or big bilateral donors. Then we uh, turn to the, uh, to the Stiftungs, and we were asking them, you were so reluctant about the creation of the endowment. Uh, is there anything you would think that endowment can do that you are not doing? And the answer generally was, no, we are doing everything uh, uh, excellently, so we don't need endowment here. But with the maybe some exceptions, uh, because basically we are focused on, on, on the, on the like-minded groups uh, because we are party-based uh, foundations. So if you, you can do some work that goes across uh, uh, parties, uh, horizontal activities that links our different type of activities, we would welcome this. And in such a way, we have a built a, a certain agenda for the first three years of endowment that is about to start. Whether it's a naive approach or it will really work and it will really fly, we will see in some, in, in some months and, and years ahead of us. But at this stage, my answer is we decided to be in a listening mode and we decided also to be coordinated. So that's, I hope, satisfies. Uh, unless I see another question, we're really down to the last couple of minutes. Uh, one last question. And, and, and then we'll close. Hi, um, it's Orhan Tanner. I'm the, with the Atlantic Council uh, Turkey office. I'm the guy who brought the stack of newspapers that Steve mentioned. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ask you a question about Turkey because we discussed it a lot uh, this morning. My question is, um, speaking of worst practices, uh, one of the excuses that uh, certain leaders have used in the past, especially in our region, for that matter, elsewhere, is the U.S. tolerance towards non-democratic processes found in energy exporting countries. Um, now that uh, with the energy revolution happening in the United States and the U.S. is becoming almost energy self-sufficient due to new energy resources as well as uh, uh, increased energy efficiency, uh, going back to Steve's points about making taking a lead earlier, um, what can the U.S. do or what can the NGOs do in terms of perhaps introducing democratic processes in those countries and whether that would set a better example for people who have been using it as an excuse for their own practices? And Orhan, who would you like to direct that to? Uh, to, to the panel, whoever wants to answer. Let's in the interest of time, do you want to pick this one up to Mike? Certainly, yeah. I'll just say a few words yeah. on that. I mean, to the extent that the United States has overlooked concerns about democracy in the past and in countries such as you describe, I think that's been a mistake. Uh, and I think we are becoming more highly attuned uh, to those issues going forward. We've seen a number of very important initiatives like the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative uh, that are seeking to elevate these concerns to the forefront of our relationships uh, with energy exporting countries. Uh, and my hope is that that trend will only intensify going forward. Uh, because what we're witnessing more and more uh, is that uh, regardless of uh, the United States' reliance on international sources of energy, uh, we've recognized that it is neither desirable nor sustainable uh, to nurture uh, the practices that, that you described in, in these countries over the long term. Uh, and we're trying to change that. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm going to... Uh, close by just saying a couple of things. First of all, I, I found this a very useful panel before I thank the panelists on, on your behalf and have you thank them. I just want to say a couple of things. The, the, Steve said it's a very good time for the U.S. and the EU to work together on these issues. And I think that's right for many of the reasons that's he was saying. And Yerzy was saying this as well. Uh, we've got a transatlantic trade and investment partnership. Yerzy, perhaps we should start talking about uh, something as a transatlantic democracy uh, partnership as well. Free trade area. Yeah. Uh, democracy, free trade um, the, I, I, to, to Micah talked about operating systems and uh, sort of a new way of looking at things. Steve made a very useful uh, comment about uh, getting together next year perhaps to, have, to workshop this a little bit and think about some really uh, interesting principles, building perhaps off some of the ideas that Steve has thrown out. And Yersi, perhaps we bring uh, our, our friends from the National Endowment of Democracy and your new endowment, uh, European uh, Endowment for Democracy, together here to Brotswold next year 
uh, to work Excellent that out. I, th I, th I think that would be, and, be and perhaps we can get you, Tamika, to help us out with that as well. But I think this is a really interesting uh, initiative. Uh, you talked about the best of times, worst of times. Uh, Dickens wrote that, and he set a uh, tale of two cities at the time, right after the French Revolution and the beginning uh, of the Industrial Revolution. We're in that kind of revolution right now. We are in this sort of historic inflection point. And so I think it's crucial at these sorts of times that leading actors like the EU and US work together not just on trade issues, but on these issues as well. So I embrace all of that. I do want to say something about tonight, because tonight uh, is our Freedom Awards, and we link this together. Uh, I want to tip my hat to Sushma Palmer, who's sitting in the front row. Uh, one of our awardees tonight is Ambassador Mark Palmer, posthumously for the work that he did during the transition in Hungary where he really showed what diplomats, foreign ministry officials, State Department officials can do. What you said about Moldova is a quite interesting uh, example of this, but uh, so that's one thing that we'll be looking at this evening. Uh, Joschka Fischer talked about uh, creating Democrats, helping that. We're also honoring uh, the uh, European Human Rights University uh, in, in Lithuania where Belarusians uh, who cannot operate freely in their own country are becoming Democrats or, or, or learning about democracy, learning about uh, how they can be positive factors in their own country going forward. So we're honoring that. Obviously, P Prime Minister Tadeusz Mazowiecki, the fact that we're honoring him is a huge thing. The role he played as the first uh, democratically, if I'm not mistaken, democratically elected Prime Minister here and in the transition uh, uh, in, in, in Poland, and then uh, uh, Malala Yousafzai, uh, the, uh, her father will be here this evening to accept uh, the award on her behalf. Uh, Prime Minister Aziz will be introducing that award. Uh, what a wonderful moment, because so much of this has to do with women's rights and, and the, uh, the right to an education, which is all part of this whole picture. So we're really trying to uh, advance this issue uh, at the Russell Global Forum. Uh, and I want to uh, thank these panelists for these very useful comments and, uh, and a little bit of a, uh, of a script that we can follow going ahead uh, on behalf of uh, all of our partners here at the Russell Global Forum and the audience here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.